a great honor to present Professor Kenneth Baines. Professor Baines is the Director of Graduate Institute Studies for the Philosophy Department of Syracuse University. He works mostly in social and political philosophy with a special focus in critical theory and contemporary German philosophy. He's also the author of a huge list of important articles and books on those topics, such as the normative founding, the normative grounds of social criticism, Kant, Rawls, and Habermas. Uh, I must say, uh, a book that was path-breaking uh, in my own studies and researches, and I'm sure that for many other Brazilian students as well. This is one of the reasons why it's so special to hear you, Professor, today. Professor Baines will present a conference on the topic equality and recognition. Professor Baines, thank you for coming. Thank you. I have to figure out what the, the right distance is here. Is this, is this good? I, I have not a strong voice. I'm, I'm a, afraid I apologize in advance. Um, so if you can hear me, wave and I'll uh, try to adjust the microphone. Um, I also would like to, to thank uh, Nita and Alessandro Maria uh, for the invitation and for the, the organization and, and for all of the, the students that, that have helped make this uh, possible as well. So within liberal political thought, uh, equality has traditionally taken a back seat to liberty. Uh, we've even seen that in the presentation of Griffin. The idea roughly has been that each person should have an equal right to liberty, where the aim of securing liberty equally is in turn demanded by a still more basic principle of respect. However, beginning more or less with Rawls, uh, the theory of justice, attempts have been made to modify this understanding of the relationship between liberty and equality, largely through refinements in what a substantive, as opposed to merely formal conception of equality of opportunity requires. More recently still, there's been an extensive discussion among egalitarians about what the appropriate metric or measure of equality should be. What is it that egalitarians want to make equal? Welfare? or well-being, a set of resources or goods, maybe income or wealth, uh, or is it perhaps a basic capabilities, as one sees in the work of Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum. Surprisingly, however, a principle of individual choice or responsibility continues to play a central role inside this account of equality. Whether it's welfare, resources, or something else, the idea has still been widely embraced that what defines egalitarianism is the aim of liberty, limiting inequalities that arise through no fault of the individual, but rather are the result of brute luck. By contrast, inequalities that do result from voluntary choices of individuals have been largely regarded as unobjectionable uh, or at least less urgent. And it's been even further argued that failure to track individual choice or responsibility in this way constitutes a failure to treat a person with equal respect. The apparent conclusion to be drawn from this round of discussion is that equality is once more subordinate to liberty. The overarching idea is that an individual should assume responsibility for his freely chosen fate, while it's only the unequal effects of bad luck that demand compensation. So there's more than a hint of irony uh, to be found in the remark of Jerry Cohen, who's a leading theorist in this tradition, who's written that these new theorists of equality have performed for egalitarians the considerable service of incorporating within it the most powerful idea in the arsenal of the anti-egalitarian right, 
that is the idea of choice and responsibility, unquote. Along with several other critics of what has been labeled luck egalitarianism, it's the position of Jerry Cohen, I believe it's a mistake to rest the egalitarian project on such a fundamental distinction between choice and circumstance, even if the recent discussions have importantly pointed to the question of how basic political values fit into a coherent account of what individuals owe each other as a matter of egalitarian justice. My presentation uh, today, in my presentation, I want to further challenge luck egalitarianism and defend a competing account of egalitarian justice, one that's variously been called social equality, Elizabeth Anderson, uh, or relational equality, uh, or democratic equality. These are all labels for the same position, I think, broadly. In the first section, I want to offer an overview of the recent debate between luck egalitarians and social egalitarians. And one aim uh, of this overview is to suggest that considerations of equality of condition, that is what is it that we're trying to get equality um, about, the metrics debate, invariably lead uh, to debates about what political equality, and in particular, the right of equal citizens to an equal opportunity to influence political outcomes amounts to. This is not only because political equality helps secure the other basic capabilities required for treating a person with respect, but also, and perhaps more importantly, because political equality emerges as a fundamental and extremely demanding value uh, in its own right. On the one hand, modern societies characterized by reasonable pluralism, uh, in societies characterized by reasonable pluralism, securing political equality is much more demanding than often assumed. The equal opportunity or equal availability of political influence imposes egalitarian demands that go well beyond uh, more familiar political rights and liberties, even while the more specific content of those demands can only be settled once political equality is secure. The sort of bootstrapping project there. On the other hand, political equality among citizens is required if there's to be a public means for determining and prioritizing further basic interests. In both cases then, or so I want to argue, equality is not simply the handmaiden of liberty, rather liberty and equality are interdependent in more complex ways than luck egalitarianism suggests. Egalitarians, on this view, should aim not at equalizing the effects of group luck in order to make room for individual responsibility, Rather, they should be committed to, uh, to quote uh, Sam Scheffler's uh, terms, a society of equals in which citizens viewed as free and equal are able to collectively govern their common fate. On this view, it makes no more sense to claim that equality is in the service of liberty than it does to claim the reverse. Perhaps better expressed a society of equals and a scheme of equal liberties reciprocally define one another, and political equality in particular um, again emerges as an importantly distinct value. Of course, luck egalitarians have not been quiet, uh, either in defending their own account of what egalitarian justice requires, or in criticizing the alternative ideal put forward by social egalitarians. So my own response to their criticisms will hopefully clarify and strengthen what I take the social egalitarian account uh, to be. In the second section, I will uh, briefly consider the importance of equality uh, that, despite its importance, attempts to achieve it uh, directly uh, are often mistaken that we should instead uh, focus on uh, what Rawls calls the basic structure, 
uh, and uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit about that this evening, but um, not as much. In the most recent uh, discussions on equality, two competing camps have uh, emerged. On the one hand, guided by this equality of what uh, question, there's a body of literature that has sought to identify a general metric of equality that could be used to compare the life prospects of otherwise diverse individuals and groups. This literature has informed the views of luck egalitarians, uh, or they often refer to themselves as responsibility sensitive egalitarians. That is, what's the proper place for responsibility in an egalitarian account? I like the first label better. On the other hand, uh, there's a body of literature, literature centered on questions of equal citizenship, democratic equality, or again, uh, what a society of equals requires. Here the focus is on the attempt to give substantive content to the formal principle of equality, that is treat equals equally, within a variety of different contexts. What is required for legal, political, economic, sexual, racial, uh, or ethnic, and ethnic equality? And what is the best arrangement of these equalities among themselves and with other values? In each of these contexts, the formal imperative to treat equals equally requires interpretation about who is to be considered an equal and what it means to treat them equally. The group of social or relational egalitarians is quite large. It includes Elizabeth Anderson, uh, Samuel Scheffler, and David Miller in the Anglo-analytic uh, tradition, but it also includes people like uh, Axel Hunnett, Nancy Fraser, Reiner Forst uh, in the more uh, German uh, tradition. Iris Young also captures this second set of concerns very nicely when she writes, I quote, equality refers not primarily to the distribution of social goods, though distributions are certainly entailed by social equality. It refers primarily to the full participation and inclusion of everyone in a society's major institutions and the socially supported substantive opportunity for all to develop and exercise their capacity and realize their choices. Similarly, in noting um, some of the similarities between his own approach and Nancy Fraser's, this is in uh, Axel Hunnett's book, uh, Redistribution and Recognition, Hunnett writes, we, that is Nancy and I agree, that the goal of social justice must be understood as the creation of social relations in which subjects are included as full members in the sense that they can publicly uphold and practice their lifestyles without shame or humiliation. Here, the point of recognition is the same as that of participatory parity, that's Nancy Fraser's term. The development and realization of individual autonomy is in a certain sense only possible when all subjects have the social preconditions for realizing their life goals without unjustifiable disadvantages and with the greatest possible freedom." Unquote. That's from Axel. Now the apparent impasse between luck egalitarian and social egalitarian interpretations of equality can be overcome, I want to suggest, by attending to the strong demands for respect or recognition that arise from the shared fate of citizens in a political society. On its best interpretation, uh, I will argue that liberal equality refers to the equal access of all individuals to the conditions required for both self-realization and self-determination, or to borrow Habermas's own formulation of this uh, project, to the conditions required for an exercise of citizens' public and private autonomy. The presence in society of any disadvantage in access to such conditions is prima facie evidence that the society is to that extent less egalitarian. 
Similarly, the state has an obligation to ensure that the costs imposed in the pursuit of otherwise legitimate programs and policies do not unfairly burden one person's pursuit of an autonomous life plan over another's. On this view, egalitarians are committed to pro providing equal access to the social conditions of public and private autonomy. However, in contrast to the prevailing view within the luck egalitarian literature, the fact that a person's unequal access may be the result of his choice does not mean that others owe him nothing as a matter of egalitarian concern. It is often both impractical and undesirable uh, to attempt to track in particular cases uh, the sources of a person's condition. So one of the criticisms Anderson, Liz Anderson develops, that it would be um, humiliating um, and uh, degrading to try to figure out in any individual case whether someone is there because uh, of choices they made or because they lack certain uh, traits and characteristics that are desirable in, in society. Rather, again, this, I'm going to shorten this part. Uh, I think this is one more argument for focusing on the basic structure of society uh, as the primary subject of justice, which is Rawls' claim. So recent discussions of equality of condition or equality of life prospects are greatly indebted to Rawls' own critique of utilitarian and more generally welfarist conceptions of equality. Equality of welfare is committed to promoting the most equitable distribution of utility or preference satisfaction compatible with other values. However, this position has been uh, subject to what's been called the expensive tastes objection. If Bill has preferences that are much more costly to satisfy than the preferences of Sam, then it seems equality of welfare requires distributing more resources to bring Bill up to the same level of welfare as Sam. But as Rawls points out, this approach ignores the extent to which individuals should be held responsible for the preferences they have. What a truly egalitarian metric ought to take into consideration is not all preferences and desires, but those which are not due to genuine choices of the individual or with which he does not uh, otherwise identify. Now this is the basis in interpretations of Rawls for the luck egalitarian argument. It's why some read Rawls as himself a, a luck egalitarian. Uh, I'm going to be arguing against uh, that position in a second. However, as critics uh, have noted, Rawls's own introduction of an account of primary goods and so a resourcist approach to equality um, as the appropriate uh, metric uh, don't necessarily follow from Rawls's own critique of welfareism, and they run into difficulties of their own. So one is, all right, if it's not welfare, then maybe it's primary goods or some other uh, resources that society develops, and we don't look at welfare measures, uh, utilities, we look rather at whether people have an equal distribution of social goods or resources. One of the better known criticisms has been offered by Marchessen. Although he agrees uh, with the critique of welfare, Sen argues that the resources or goods approach is fetishistic in his terms. Resourcists like Rawls focus on what it is that individuals have rather than what they are able to do or be with what they have. This has led Sen and others to propose uh, what he calls a capabilities or functionings account of the egalitarian metric. The aim then is to identify a range of human functionings or capabilities relative to an in part culturally defined notion of well-being. Such functionings range from very elementary ones, such as escaping morbidity and mortality, 
to being adequately nourished and having mobility uh, to higher or more complex ones, such as being happy, achieving self-respect, taking part in the life of the community, and, quoting Sen again, appearing in public without shame. A society is more egalitarian to the extent it provides equally an effective opportunity for each citizen to develop and exercise the range of human capabilities. Now finally, in a, in a third round of discussion, uh, critics such as uh, Dick Arneson and Jerry Cohen have pointed out uh, the difficulties in the capabilities approach. In particular, there's a problem of indexing since individuals have uh, a great diversity of capabilities and since any two individuals may have very different sets, uh, how are we gonna measure uh, equality? Thus, if one attends to capabilities rather than welfare or primary goods, there seems to be no common measure in terms of which judgments of equality can be made. According to Arneson, this implies that Sen's capabilities approach must either uh, become uh, extremely objective or perfectionistic, um, criticism often made of Martha Nussbaum as well, which many find um, unacceptable in a uh, liberal democratic society, or, uh, this is really Arneson's argument, it collapses into a modified form of, of welfareism uh, itself, what Arneson calls equality of opportunity for welfare. Jerry Cohen, by contrast, claims that Arneson's retreat to welfareism is overly hasty and introduces and Cohen introduces a notion of what he calls midfair as an alternative to sense capabilities. Midfair is a heterogeneous set of goods, something between utility and goods that comprise the conditions for well-being. Not utility, uh, since it's not simply a matter of an individual's mental state or desires, but not goods, since the concern uh, is with what goods do for individuals. That was Sen's criticism. Further, Cohen claims that while it may be difficult to develop a complete or full metric, it's still possible and worthwhile to develop, develop a list of basic mid-fair corresponding to what he calls, quote, a normal human existence. Now this would include for Cohen uh, such fundamental goods as health, nutrition, and housing, and for him, it's only when it's a matter of the higher or more complex uh, capabilities that issues of pluralism begin to complicate his own model. Nonetheless, uh, according to Cohen, his focus on midfair remains true at least to one central egalitarian concern, that no one should be lacking uh, in an urgent uh, desideratum, that's a quote from Cohen, through no fault uh, of his own. Now while clearly preferable to some of the available alternatives, uh, Cohen's own proposal still seems to me unacceptable as an egalitarian metric. Despite its attention to fundamental capabilities, it remains captive to what Iris Young has called the distributive paradigm in theories of justice. His notion of midfair focuses on basic capabilities to the ne neglect of higher capabilities that, at least in many current social movements, are the primary focus of attention. In this respect, I think it even falls behind, behind Rawls's concern to secure an equal and effective exercise of the two moral powers, which John Christoph was referring to uh, earlier, this capacity to form pursue and revise the conception of the good um, and have a sense of justice. If, if following Iris Young, the capabilities whose equal and effective opportunity for development society ought to ensure is broadened to include self-realization and self-determination, the resources required would have to be modified. In particular, they would have to include much greater access to decision-making structures and processes, a more extens extensive reconfiguration of the social division of labor, 
and greater participation in the production and interpretation of cultural meaning. In short, as it presently stands, Cohen's model would seem to have the least to offer or say on just those questions that many contemporary social movements regard as most uh, important. Uh, in, in that respect, uh, Cohen is uh, very disappointing. In a second, um, uh, more fundamental criticism of equality of condition, Elizabeth Anderson argues that these theorists have lost sight of the proper aim of equality. According to Liz Anderson, this literature has, for a variety of reasons, become focused on compensating people for undeserved luck. For example, I quote, being born with poor native endowment, bad parents, disagreeable personalities, or suffering from accidents and illness and so forth. That's the sort of target of the luck egalitarians. By contrast, she continues, the proper negative aim of egalitarian justice is not to eliminate the impact of brute luck, but to end oppression, which by definition is socially imposed. Its proper positive aim, this is all a quote from Anderson, is not to ensure that everyone gets what they morally deserve, but to create a community in which people stand in relations of equality to others. She describes this alternative as democratic equality and states that its aim is to guarantee all law-abiding citizens effective access to the social conditions of their freedom at all times, unquote. The former model, again, which she dubs luck egalitarianism, she's responsible for that term, loses sight of the relational dimension and as a result becomes too exclusively focused on whether a person's condition is due to circumstances over which she has no control or to choices for which she must bear responsibility. But this account seems to misconstrue the connection, proper connection, between liberty and equality. Egalitarians should not employ a distinction between choice and circumstance in order, in order to compensate people for the latter while leaving the outcomes resulting from choice wherever they fall. This view, as Anderson points out, uh, suggests that, as her example, the motorcyclist who voluntarily declines health insurance is not, as a matter of equality, owed anything uh, if he has a serious accident. It also suggests that whenever the disadvantage, if it's due to brute luck rather than choice, the individual is, if it's due to brute luck, is entitled to compensation uh, as a matter of equality. Yet Anderson wonders, do we really owe compensation for an expensive taste? Say, an intense desire for an exotic vacation in Florianopolis. <laughs> Simply because the desire is not chosen. It, it passively grabbed me, right? Finally, the, the goal of distributing on the basis of what is due to choice and what is a matter of unchosen circumstance could lead to extensive invasions by the state into the private liberties of citizens, as well as potentially humiliating judgments regarding the causes of an individual's condition. Are you, are you in this really wretched condition? Uh, because of brute luck? Or are you there because of choices, right? Irresponsible choices that you made. In short, despite the appeal of guaranteeing equal access to advantage, something seems to have gone gravely wrong with this particular construal of the relation between freedom and equality. Her alternative account has a different aim, as I just mentioned, to remove social oppression and to secure the condition for everyone's freedom. Her account also rejects both welfare and resources as the appropriate egalitarian metric, and also, like Cohen, draws upon uh, Sen's work. More specifically, though, Anderson identifies three broad sets of capabilities that should be of paramount concern to egalitarians. The ability to function as a human being, 
the ability uh, to function, to be a participant in a system of cooperative production, and thirdly, um, uh, to be a citizen uh, of a democratic state. Now any Hegelians here ought to quickly recognize uh, what those three uh, parts make up in Hegel's own uh, Rex theory. In connection with each of these general capabilities, she then proposes a more specific uh, set of functionings. For example, to effectively function as a citizen requires, I quote, rights to political participation, such as freedom of speech and the franchise, and also effective access to the goods and relationships of civil society. This entails freedom of association, access to public spaces, such as roads, parks, and public transportation, the postal service, and telecommunications. And this also entails social conditions of being set, accepted by others, such as the ability to appear in public without shame and not be ascribed an outcast status." Unquote. Now she also uh, develops corresponding lists for the two other uh, capabilities, and, but the a specific proposal she makes are not what's most important for me uh, right now. Uh, I'm more interested in developing the contrast with luck egalitarianism. But I want to mention uh, one further uh, point in her account. Uh, she develops her view not primarily in positive terms of a society of equals, but in connection with different forms of uh, inequality that she opposes. Here there's another very deep similarity with Axel Honneth's work on disrespect. Egalitarians should be concerned with the elimination of three different types of hierarchy, Anderson argues. Hierarchies of domination and command, in which some exercise unequal authority or power over others. Hierarchies of esteem, in which the character traits of some are valued more uh, than others while others are subject to stigmatization and humiliation. And third, hierarchies of standing, in which the opportunities and resources are more open to some, while others lack access and are marginalized socially. This last form of hierarchy is perhaps closest to the distributivist model, or to the opportunities available in society, but uh, it's not the only uh, type of hierarchy that egalitarians should be concerned with, and the wrong of any of the hierarchies cannot necessarily be remedied by the provision of some good. As Anderson points out, it's also quite possible for an individual or group to suffer with respect to one type of hierarchy, uh, but not with respect to another. Uh, gays, for example, may be economically relatively uh, well off, uh, but um, not uh, capable of uh, full inclusion uh, in society. So uh, to repeat that, social egalitarians really have a quite different aim than this luck egalitarian vision of compensating for brute luck. Now of course, uh, luck egalitarians have not been silent in response, uh, nor have they failed to develop criticisms of their own. Richard Arneson, perhaps the most uh, forceful critic um, uh, uh, in a, a host of articles, uh, he acknowledges that the ideal of a democratic society, of democratic equality, or of a society of equals is an attractive ideal, but he suggests that uh, it is not luck egalitarians, but social egalitarians who are confused about what the fundamental commitment of an egalitarian should be. So part of the debate is what's really fundamental uh, in thinking about equality. What is it that we're most concerned with? Social egalitarianism, he suggests, also stands in a very uneasy relation uh, to what's called sufficientarianism. The, the idea that we have an obligation to provide uh, resources or to bring others up to a certain level of sufficiency, but once you reach that level, you don't have any further egalitarian obligations to equalize. So once everyone has sufficient, adequate access um, to 
terms of social life, we don't need to be concerned with inequalities beyond that. He thinks that's just very unegalitarian. Commenting on Anderson, Artisan notes, uh, some of her remarks suggests that the demands of social equality are met, can be met if everyone is just brought to a certain level and beyond that, um, inequalities no longer matter. But he claims it seems just arbitrary to, insor to insist that resources must be expand expended to bring everybody up to this level of sufficiency, perhaps even at very great social cost, to bring everyone to this level, while those above that level, maybe even just a little bit above that level, have no further egalitarian claims, uh, even when the cost to improve their situation may not be so great. Further, Arneson claims it might also be possible to bring about a society of equals and still have a society in which all lead fair, miserable lives by uh, a metric of, of welfare. And this is sometimes also called the leveling down objection in other uh, contexts. You might be able to achieve equality, but everyone could be still a very miserable world. Uh, it'd still be equal. Third, uh, Arneson suggests that social egalitarians have no way to distinguish between those types of hierarchy that are to be condemned as bad or unjust and those that are acceptable, given that uh, as many, including Anderson, recognize we can't eliminate all hierarchy. So he concludes that the ideal of social equality can't be basic or fundamental in the way that social egalitarians have claimed. And finally, Arneson, as well as others, uh, have responded that, to the social egalitarian critique of responsibility, and they ask just what is the place of individual accountability, responsibility within your own account. I gave you the Rawls quote earlier, um, Anderson too, it seems, where does individual responsibility fit into your account? I'm gonna limit myself to commenting on just these last uh, two questions. How should we think about individual responsibility within the social egalitarian view? Um, and uh, how can social egalitarians go about determining which hierarchies may be unjust and which others may be uh, perfectly acceptable. Exploring these, my response to these two um, um, criticisms, uh, I hope will illuminate further the differences between a luck egalitarian view and a social egalitarian view, and uh, also locate uh, the importance of a notion of recognition mutual recognition or mutual respect uh, within the social egalitarian account. Sofia Stemploska uh, has explored the question of the place of responsibility within egalitarian justice extensively. She's also a co-editor of a, a collection of essays on just this topic. She argues, uh, on the one hand, that some of the criticisms by Anderson and others uh, about you know, leaving the motorcyclist to, to die in the ditch uh, as a matter of egalitarian concern um, are just extremely uncharitable readings of luck egalitarianism. And she attempts to kind of come back defending the luck egalitarian view. While it's true, great significance is placed on this choice circumstance distinction, she argues all luck egalitarians also acknowledge uh, that a responsibility-sensitive egalitarianism must uh, also account for the background conditions or structure of opportunities uh, in which choices are made. She argues this uh, both with uh, Dworkin's version uh, and uh, with uh, Cohen, and I, I think skip that uh, for the moment. On the other hand, she points out that despite her criticisms, Anderson concedes, and I, I quote uh, Stemploska now, egalitarianism must face up to the need to uphold personal responsibility if only to avoid bankrupting the state, uh, unquote. I mean, it leads to the sort of moral hazard problem, right? If, if you'll be kind of not suffer uh, any uh, consequence uh, for decisions 
uh, choices that you make, you know, you'll take all kinds of risks and leads to all kinds of problems and moral hazard. And Anderson, of course, wants to acknowledge this. And then the, the question is, how does it fit in? Social egalitarians owe us an account of when citizens can be expected to bear the costs of their choices. Stemplowski's own position, like Arneson, is that a responsibility-sensitive egalitarianism, like egalitarianism, can best answer uh, that question. She attempts to do it by appeal uh, to what citizens owe one another as a matter of equal or mutual respect. The idea is to show that her own version of luck egalitarianism um, um, captures what it means to show equal respect uh, to one another, and so provides a basis for uh, addressing these two questions. What's most fundamental, and how to deal with individual responsibility. In Stemplos' own account, um, there's an attempt to draw conclusions of what I call following others substantive responsibility. Uh, that is, um, who bears the costs uh, for certain decisions uh, from an interpretation of moral responsibility or what's sometimes called responsibility as attributability, that is, whether you can blame someone uh, for their conduct. But in many other normative theories, Rawls, for example, the link between substantive and moral responsibility is much less direct. Uh, quoting Rawls, the political conception of justice includes what we may call a social division of responsibility. Society, the citizens as a collective body, accepts the responsibility for maintaining the equal basic liberties and fair quality of opportunity and for providing a fair share of other primary goods for everyone within this framework, while citizens as individuals accept responsibility for revising and adjusting their ends and aspirations in view of the all-purpose means they can expect given their present and foreseeable situation." Unquote. This view does not attempt to derive claims about substantive or consequential responsibility directly from the idea of equal moral respect, but assumes, in addition, the idea that citizens are members of a system of social cooperation. This is also what uh, singles it out as a political conception. So for Rawls, we're not trying to get from, as a matter of moral respect, what do we owe one another as citizens is another term that comes in. Given that we're also participants in a system of social cooperation, what expectations can we have uh, for what we owe one another? And it's from that that uh, questions of substantive responsibility are addressed. On the second challenge raised by luck egalitarians, uh, that there's no way to distinguish between acceptable and unacceptable hierarchies. Um, and so again, that it can't be fundamental in the way Anderson uh, suggests. Uh, this criticism, I think, is also uh, simply too quick. Why can't social egalitarians appeal to an idea of moral respect, just as we saw was the case uh, in Stemploska's proposal? And in fact, I think this is what social egalitarians do, but the, their understanding of moral respect differs from the luck egalitarian position. So the approach could be very easily stated. Um, the working out the details, as we'll see, is much more complex. But the basic idea is that those social hierarchies that upset the basic respect required for citizens to regard one another as equals are unacceptable. Um, I'm sorry, that, that sentence didn't work. <laughs> the basic idea is that those social hierarchies that upset the basic accept respect required for citizens are unacceptable and need to be removed or neutralized. 
Now stated in this way, it might seem uncontroversial at the position that both luck egalitarians and social egalitarians could accept. We affirm a basic world of quality, one say that informs the notion of what Darwell calls recognition, respect, that all can claim as moral persons, but still leaves room for significant hierarchies of esteem and uh, what uh, 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 Darwin calls appraisal respect. That is, you know, we can esteem people in all different kinds of ways, but that's quite distinct and separate from recognition respect. But I believe the social egalitarian account differs from this more standard or familiar account in two ways. Unlike Stemploska's proposal, it does not attempt to derive claims about substantive or consequential responsibility, that is what we owe one another as citizens, directly from a principle of equal moral respect. Rather, it takes into consideration again the idea that citizens are members in a system of social cooperation that gives rise to much more uh, demanding um, egalitarian obligations. And second, it allows that there can be a more dynamic or interactive relation between citizens um, standing uh, and their uh, status, or between uh, recognition respect and status respect or appraisal respect. The standard interpretation fails to see the multiple ways in which social hierarchies or economies of esteem or what um, Anthony Appiah calls honor codes, can affect a person's standing as a citizen. Um, now, I'll stop from the text and, and just conclude with uh, two examples of what it is that, that I have in mind here, because I, I think this is perhaps the, uh, the more controversial, or it's uh, surely the more original <laughs> part in, in uh, my presentation this evening. So I have in mind two different kinds of scenarios, both of which will lead to a, a failure of a citizen to be treated as an equal, but they work in different ways. The, the first um, strategy uh, or scenario is one in which the citizen will not feel entitled to make the claims to which he or she is entitled, and as a result will be treated unequally. Um, and the second doesn't have to, so to speak, go through the individual's own sense of uh, respect in this same way. It, it, it can circumvent it uh, altogether. So on the, the first model, if you want, it, it operates, so to speak, through the individual. So individual traits and characteristics are not valued and esteemed by others in society. Pick your favorite example. This can give rise then to a lack of self-esteem on the part of the individual, which can in turn lead to failures of self-respect on his or her part. That is the, it's not like you can maintain your self-respect no matter what your self-esteem is. It's that social hierarchies that impact negatively on self-esteem can also work to undermine one's sense of self-respect. For example, uh, uh, Axel has written on this as well as um, uh, Timo Juden uh, and, and uh, many others. Different types of work or employment right, are not valued in a society, which can lead then uh, to um, a lack of um, uh, social inclusion. Um, and in turn then um, lowers one's sense of self-esteem, which then impacts one's sense of uh, self-respect. Similar arguments I think can be made about one's religious identity, about one's linguistic identity, uh, or one's gender or sexual identity. In the second scenario I have in mind, the failure uh, to esteem traits doesn't have to go through the individual's own sense of self-esteem and self-respect, 
um, it can, so to speak, work uh, more directly. Um, if society right, fails to value other citizens um, in uh, a variety of ways, um, it will, in the society, lead to um, a failure of respecting that person and so treating that uh, person uh, as an equal. An example here would be um, the, the kinds of cases discussed by Miranda Fricker with respect to epistemic injustice, right? Um, not um, having your voice recognized or heard may have nothing to do with your own sense of whether you um, value yourself uh, and respect yourself. It's just the injustice of the hermeneutic situation um, or the failure of others to respect you um, leads to that voice being silenced or not uh, given full recognition. So it doesn't have to go through the, uh, that is the, the effect of uh, social hierarchies uh, leading to failures of respect and failing to be treated as an equal don't have to go through the individual's own sense of self-esteem, impairing his or her sense of self-respect. They can operate, uh, so to speak, uh, more directly. So what um, I'm going to end here by my view is that I, I think that uh, social egalitarians do have resources uh, to distinguish between what kinds of social hierarchies um, are wrong or unjust, which ones are uh, perfectly acceptable. There's a lot more uh, to be said about that. Um, and so um, they need not concede that you have to look elsewhere, especially not uh, to the luck egalitarian position to try to address some of those questions. And so I think the social egalitarian also doesn't have to concede that the luck egalitarian view is somehow a more fundamental embrace uh, of basic egalitarian commitments. Um, uh, this equality of opportunity for welfare is really the leading candidate that's Arneson again. Um, rather, I think social egalitarians should cling to the vision of a society of equals focusing on, again, the different kinds of inequalities that um, social movements and so forth have found so objectionable um, in the egalitarian tradition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Baines. Uh, well, we still have some time for questions. I would suggest, I don't know who we prefer, to take more than one question uh, at the same time, then you answer it. I can try. Yeah, because it tends to be quicker, but... Yeah. Okay, so... will get here, if I may. Okay. Uh, let me plead the, the devil's advocate rule uh, in terms of, you know, um, criticizing the social egalitarianism. My question is quite specific. Um, let's assume that social egalitarians are right about the importance of these patterns of recognition uh, that are quite independent of the amount of wealth, resources, um, desert, uh, that uh, affect other approaches to justice. Um, is there room for drawing a distinction within the social egalitarian paradigm between uh, lack of recognition, lack of mutual respects that are a matter of morality, that is, it's morally wrong to say you're a faggot or to talk to you in a the wrong every way just because of your sexual preferences, that's, yeah, I guess, to most of us, immediately uh, a, a, a clear case of immorality, of you know, violation of morality. But I think that you want to say that it's also a question of justice, right? So it's a question... That it's not a question of justice. That it is. 
I think that a social uh, egalitarian is committed to say that it is also a question of justice. Now, since I don't think you want to make a theory in which any expression of a certain ideological view that are, that are you know, clearly questionable from a moral point of view also become something that gets the police enter into the picture or that you know, creates a violation of justice. So my question is simply, where do you draw the line? Recognition, lack of recognition that is an immorality, lack of recognition that becomes a, a crime. A very short question, thank you very much. Uh, do you think if one looks to human rights, uh, they are also of course dealing with equalities, and everybody is born equal in so, but they are fighting for unequality, fighting against legal or irrespectable uh, uh, dis, uh, discrimination in a sense. So, I think from the political and legal uh, perspective, the fight against uh, unjustified uh, discriminations and unequal treatments and unequal situation are the most important one. And by this, they are also offer a medium, let's say a procedure, how to decide what kind of inequality could be acceptable and what not, just by saying using I would say the political human rights. And it seems to me that when you are talking about, in the beginning of the lecture, that political egalitarians uh, offer us a basic uh, fundamental for, for, for the whole discussion, uh, then you are in this way, but in the end it seems to me that you are not explaining it uh, more, maybe you can do it. Next time, we'll get on lecture. Well, I, I have thanks for for your talk. First, I have two quick, two quick questions. The first is related to Hornet and the new the, the, the reading the, of uh, the talk of Hornet uh, about the uh, hierarchy of domination. Well, I, uh, I was wondering if uh, Hornet could play a, a role also in the for the first part of your talk of your paper. I mean, uh, I'm referring to the part uh, which was related to the nexus to the linkage between equality and liberty. As you know, uh, Hunnett developed a, a sort of third way for, uh, for addressing the, the, the question about freedom. So negative freedom, positive freedom, and social freedom. I was wondering if we uh, let enter this entire, uh, this entire piece of theory into the picture, things could change about the relation between equality and liberty or freedoms that you put. Second, very quick uh, issue. Uh, what about adaptive preferences? Uh, I mean, uh, you, uh, you um, uh, told us and uh, give a lot of argumentations by, for saying, okay, uh, we have to select voluntary uh, equality, but uh, there are good counter arguments that are. Uh, let's say, open to consider uh, the fact that uh, we are, that we can accept unequal orders also in voluntary forms. Uh, do, uh, we can willingly accept uh, uh, unfair uh, or uh, unequal uh, settings of uh, primary goods and so on and so forth. Do uh, hierarchical motivation, historical motivation, cultural motivation, and so on and so forth. So the topics about uh, 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 adaptive preferences perhaps could be uh, another particular point for reopening uh, the, the argument about uh, self-understanding. Uh, yeah, uh, these are all good, very good questions, very, very hard questions. Uh, I, uh, to Luigi, I do uh, think that it's a, a matter of egalitarian justice uh, that the concern is. So it isn't just um, um, that we want, in some cases, to uh, criticize someone for behaving um, 
immorally or badly or speaking badly. Um, so it raised, does raise questions like um, uh, whether there should be laws prohibiting hate speech, uh, various types of hate speech. I'm much more willing to go down that line. I think that maybe some uh, sort of liberals, other liberals maybe are, but I think that um, you know, if the uh, persistence of um, various forms of uh, derogatory um, uh, speech um, ha can be shown uh, to have impact on the self-esteem uh, of individuals, uh, enhance then their ability to appear in public without shame, um, uh, or again, if um, this kind of speech also, it, you know, when uh, another example, sometimes these hierarchies of esteem, uh, they seem sort of benign, but they get various kinds of uh, further uh, social support, institutional support of one sort or another that then makes the, the effects uh, of these practices much more damaging and, and harmful. So um, I don't think there's a, you know, a, a, a quick answer to the, the question that you're asking about, you know, are you really saying as a matter of, of justice, uh, we have to, to work to eliminate certain hierarchies of the esteem? I, I think the answer is yes. I mean, I, that's the position I'm willing to, to work with. Uh, but of course, equality too has to be balanced with other uh, political values. Uh, and the moral values, liberties, and so forth. So you have, you know, there's not, but my concern is that equality not always be seen to take this back seat. So part of it is the kind of critique of, you know, the very name liberalism suggests liberty is first. And uh, I'm trying to challenge that uh, tradition, and it probably would lead to more uh, forms of social regulation uh, as a matter of justice. Um, um, on the human rights, again, uh, it's a very difficult question, I think. I've defended in uh, some of my work a uh, political conception of human rights that sort of worked up from the bottom from this idea of society as a system of cooperation out um, rather than um, trying to start from a, a kind of more abstract normative view. I mean, I know you're in, in some sympathy with this view as well. I think historic, human rights are a historical project. Um, it, it would be a, a much longer and interesting question to see what the, you know, how, how one should understand taking uh, political society as the, the kind of starting framework or category, which is, I think, what this political approach is committed to do, um, to working up then to what um, your account of human rights uh, would, would look like. I don't think there's a fixed set of human rights. That's what I mentioned earlier, is there a human right to, to democracy? I, I hope eventually there will be. I'm not sure there is now. Uh, but I think it has to do with uh, whether or not um, historical and social transformations already underway alter the relations that uh, uh, individuals and groups stand in relative to one another that will alter then the kinds of demands and obligations. So something like a more egalitarian demand kicks in the more um, the um, um, regimes of governance um, are worldwide. So this is, I think, close to the, the questions then was, was raising before. I don't see it as an all-affected principle, I see it as an all-subjected principle, which is something Nancy Fraser has, has worked on. So, I mean, it's a, a large question, but I, I take a kind of different approach. I don't try to give a normative theory of human rights from a notion of human dignity or normative agency, or, uh, but I, I think there we might actually be more in agreement. Yes, Axel's notion of social freedom certainly fits. Um, there, there's another debate that I didn't really touch on. Um, part of his critique with Nancy, in fact, is 
you know, whether you can do this all within a kind of, um, the term she uses is a, a deontological framework, or whether you have a more teleological account. Axel wants to have a formal theory of the good life <laughs> to try to avoid uh, some of those questions. And so that's, I think, where his more Hegelian view of, of social freedom as a matter of justice, I think, Axel certainly still wants to claim it as a matter of justice, um, might look a bit different from the views of, of Scheffler or uh, Anderson or um, uh, Josh Cohen as another uh, figure in this other uh, egalitarian tradition. I've myself written a little on adaptive preference formation uh, and its connection to um, uh, understandings of individual autonomy. I think once you uh, ask for a, a relational account of autonomy, the, the topic of adaptive preferences becomes even more intense because now you want to know whether the preferences, a sort of rough sketch, whether the preferences a person has are ones that she could give uh, convincing reasons to, to a relevant um, community of her, her peers. Uh, if so, then she's making free choices. Um, if uh, she can't, um, then I think there, you know, on, on either of these two scenarios, right, it might be, right, adaptive preference formation can come about through this phenomenon of what uh, is called gaslighting, right, in the, in the movie, that one loses one's sense of worth and value and doesn't see oneself as a full participant, as able to make claims. But it can happen in other ways uh, as well. I think it's an important topic in in this account as well. So at least you have some fingers in the air. Uh, it's up to you to stop now or go a little bit more. <laughs> Ten minutes more. Okay. Okay. Numzu uh, Filippi. Uh, Thank you very much, Professor, for your talk. Uh, I would like to uh, stress uh, a deficit in uh, the... I would like to stress and point out a deficit in uh, social egalitarianism. Even if I sympathize with social egalitarianism, but I think that in when they criticize the classical paradigm of redistribution or distribution and say that what matters is not only or primarily the distribution of goods and uh, social egalitarian think they think that what matters is the, the hierarchy uh, and the, the relation of domination, relation of power between people. I But uh, the problem is that uh, when they make this uh, 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 step, uh, they forgot uh, the point that what matter is also the distribution of goods. And they say very little about the, about the, the criteria of distribution, the principle of distribution. For is it possible? Maybe shut it off. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Uh, the problem, I think, that is when they make this step about the, um, what matters is the domination relation of between people or citizens, they forgot that the distribution of goods matter, and uh, they say more about the metric of justice, resource, wealth, or capability, but they forgot about the criteria for the principle of distribution. And for example, Anderson said that oh, oh, well, we can be sufficient. That your talk, uh, uh, remember, recall us that if you are sufficient, you don't uh, care about the equality uh, above this. <coughs> and uh, I think that other uh, social egalitarians egalitari uh, uh, have in their theories on account this kind of text. They say very, very little about the distribution of goods, and they go to the hierarchy. Uh, depend also on the distribution of goods, not only the economy, uh, but also political, because you can translate on that your uh, economic power and political and so on. So on. I, this uh, is my doubt, and uh, I would like to, to think about this.
Yeah, I, I haven't thought a lot about um, you know, where is some measure of sufficiency adequate. Um, what would it mean to be, uh, have an adequate um, level of um, resources and access to participate uh, as a political <coughs> This goes back to Rousseau, right? Uh, I mean, that could be an extremely demanding ideal already, not really leave a lot of room for inequalities. And Rousseau's formulation was probably, right, no one should be so rich that they can buy someone else, no one should be so poor that uh, they have to sell themselves. That's probably not the right measure. <laughs> right? Um, but, um, so what is the level of sufficiency to be able to participate as an equal? I would agree with America require breaking up um, the connection between um, um, power, economic power and political um, power, right? What would that uh, require to really to tease those apart? It could already be extremely demanding redistributively. So I, I agree with you, they maybe don't talk about it as, as much as they should under Liz Anderson. Liz Anderson's third category of um, standing, hierarchies of standing, she's talking about opportunities have to be equal. So in some notion of fair equality of opportunity, now we are so far <laughs> from anything like fair equality of, of uh, opportunity before you even get to talk about, well, what about differences in natural talents and uh, abilities, which fair equality leaves them. In place. So um, I agree. Uh, but every, they all say, of course, distribution matters. Uh, but then, all right, maybe they don't um, develop it. But I think there are resources there uh, to go um, quite a ways. Uh, you get the same problem on the luck egalitarian side. Cohen will you know, make all this defense about, I just want to get one more dig uh, how important it is make this choice circumstance distinction fundamental. What have we chosen? Um, what is our unchosen fate? I'm trying to make freedom so central. And then he says, oh, but of course, I could be a determinist. Um, and so then, uh, there were an equality of outcomes guy because no one makes any choice. I think that's an insane kind of view to be taking uh, about <laughs> how to think about social inequalities. It first just throws the whole debate over into the metaphysics of freedom, which I've been a philosopher for a long time. You'll never get a <laughs> Right, that, that, that debate's going to go on forever. We have to wait for metaphys metaphysicians to agree on whether we have free choice or not before we can figure out what citizens owe to one another. I, I think we're just really going in the wrong direction. So that's going to be Sympathies. I mean, Jerry Cohen, this Marxist, who, who spent his life criticizing Nozick, and then ends up wanting to say um, this choice circumstance distinction is really sort of what equality is all about. Um, and the other just, I mean, I admire him, but this other crazy remark, he says, I just want to figure out what justice is whether or not it can have any practical application or not. I mean, that is Platonism written in capital letters uh, that I, I just think we're, you know, we're, we're in the wrong game. Anyway, <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Philip, that can stand up very quickly time. My question uh, concerns your last the last part of your talk uh, on the difference between esteem and respect. Because I think uh, here on the quality we have an interesting point uh, concerning esteem, uh, this is made by Oren, but also other uh, uh, authors. Uh, because esteem here concerns on the particular side, yeah? Yes. While uh, respect is on the universalistic approach, on the, the, to be protected by, by law and the juridical forms. Uh, of recognition. So, uh, in the esteem part, uh, I wonder which criteria we have to differentiate uh, uh, what are the, the particular claims that should be morally 
relevant uh, in, a, in, a, in the equality approach. So if you will be in the discussion of equality, not every particular uh, claims that should be direct on steam or, or claims on self-steam should be morally relevant. So how we can then put these two different universalist right, respect and, and the steam uh, uh, compatible. Right, it's the individual's particular traits, whether they're valued well, in a society or not. So the, the other sort of Rawlsian move that I um, make in this paper is to move that notion of recognition respect over to the idea, or combine it with the idea of um, citizens participating in a system of social cooperation and now the, the notion that arises is that what he calls legitimate expectations. And this is different than trying to develop this account as I think, you know, that try to uh, you know, uh, track who bears the costs uh, back to a notion of who's morally responsible uh, for the cost. This is a different idea that talks about allocating so legitimate expectations, right? A finding basis of determining legitimate expectations in the system of, of cooperation. I think that already complicates a strong universalistic view of, of recognition respects uh, in relation to the uh, appraisal respect or, or uh, status respect on, on the other hand. Because now you have to look at when in the system of social cooperation, um, why is it that um, CEOs right, get such high appraisal um, respect and um, you know, the garbage collector or uh, the burger flipper or um, you know, the, the nurse or the daycare um, uh, is not valued for the So we have to challenge those because they have an impact. That's sort of uh, a kind of example I'm going to think that not valuing these individuals for these traits that, that they have, whether they were chosen or not, um, not valuing them leads to uh, failures of self-esteem and I think failures then to be treated as an equal in that uh, society. That's the dynamic. Uh, I don't think there's going to be a kind of quick answer. I'd like to hate the speech question. You know, I mean, you know, if racial slurs and and uh, sexist remarks and so forth, they didn't have any effect on someone's self-esteem. That I mean, we may think about it differently. I mean, you might want to know, but then adapt the preference communication first. But um, I mean, you know, I'm trying to be, I think they're difficult questions that depend on also the insights of social science uh, to determine whether or not um, there's some literature now saying self-respect um, isn't something that should be relational or recognitional at all. The self-respect is something you're supposed to keep um, and not have damage uh, even when others are calling you names and throwing stones at you. And the, the idea is the stoic view of self-respect that it can't be or ought not to be damaged or impaired by these hierarchies of esteem in society. I mean, maybe that's a nice point to deal with at some point, but it's not sort of how social practices work. So that's the sort of alternative of, uh, to this dynamic model. That, you know, yeah, I mean, are individual traits, social traits, uh, some we do, some hierarchies we want to. Like, I'm not one of these, I, I'm a parent went through all of this that every kid has to get exactly the same appraisal from his or her school teacher so that you know, they all get stars for some point. You know? I mean, that's, but, but there's probably more benign view. We need to be recognizing a lot more um, uh, honors, honor codes, right? And some of the honor codes are just really quite um, arbitrary and, and also I mean, beauty kind. Everyone always uses the example of beauty kind. I don't, probably should be troubling, I think, in a society that cares about, about gender and, and maybe others as well. So the, the question of which traits we esteem in society 
and how those hierarchies of esteem give access to other social opportunities. That's what I think the egalitarian, a big egalitarian focus should be. I, I'm so sorry. I know that there are more questions, but they're going to either set me it's over. Yes, we are here. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Ye